I like going fast. And you probably do too. Today on Wheelhouse, we're asking, how fast will cars get? Humans have always had a taste for speed, well before cars were a glint in anyone's eye. The 19th century saw the rise of the Industrial Revolution and railways, and in 1829, George Stevenson's rocket locomotive reached an unheard of 30 miles per hour. But by the end of the century, trains were able to reach speeds of 120 miles an hour. That's insane. From 1894 to 1914, speeds achieved by the automobile rose exponentially, as did the complexity of their design. Engine layouts went from one cylinder to 12, from brakes on just the rear wheels to brakes all around, from steam engines to carbureted four-cylinder internal combustion engines. The Benz Patent Motor Wagon, built around 1885, was the first car of its kind to reach a wind-whipping speed of, wait for it, 10 miles per hour. That's fast. Mm -hmm. Within a decade, the steam-powered Stanley Roundabout, more commonly known as the Stanley Steamer, was lightning fast by comparison at 35 miles an hour. As the car evolved and as speed became a priority, what wasn't yet clear was the difference between race cars and road cars. Racetracks weren't really a thing yet, so speed records, at least early on, had to be done on public roads. By the 1920s, cars were hitting speeds of over 100 miles per hour. The Duesenberg Model J, manufactured in Indiana, hit 119 miles per hour and was followed by the company's souped up SJ model, which was said to do over 140 miles per hour, helping to coin the term, it's a doozy. The first man to make a serious attempt at the 200 mile an hour barrier was a dude named Sir Henry O'Neill de Hain Seagrave in 1927. He would pilot a custom built land speed racer called the Sunbeam 1000 horsepower mystery slug and that's what it was called. That's actually what it was called. The Blood Red Racer had two aircraft engines on board, one in front of Henry and one behind. When Seagrave and the Sunbeam team took the car to Daytona Beach to go for the record, so many people showed up to watch that Henry had to abort a few test runs because spectators were standing on the nine mile long course, just in the way. After police showed up to block people from being in the car's way, Henry set off, pushing the car to a blistering, 200.669 miles an hour. After the run, Henry pressed on the brakes to slow down, but to his surprise, the intense speed quickly burned his brakes out. So he had no choice but to drive into the ocean to slow down. I'm not lying about that. After pulling the car out and making some repairs, Henry turned around and went for another run, this time averaging 203 miles per hour. Just seven years later, in 1935, Sir Malcolm Campbell was the first man to break the 300 mile an hour mark in his Bluebird Streamliner. The sands of Daytona weren't practical for such high speeds, so Campbell had to go all the way to the wide open Bonneville Salt Flats of Utah to set his record, a place that would soon become the mecca of land speed racing. After World War II, hot rod culture was bustling with enthusiasts meeting in the deserts of Nevada and Bonneville with the hope of breaking world speed records in their own customized rides. They would drive anything from road going roadsters to completely handmade streamliners fashioned out of fighter plane fuel tanks. While men like John Cobb and Craig Breedlove were smashing the 400, 500, and even 600 mile an hour records, things were going a little slower back in the production car world. In 1949, the fastest car in the world was the Jaguar XK120 with a top speed of 120 miles an hour. While your buddy's Hyundai might be faster today, 120 in a car meant for the road back then was very impressive. The 1950s brought the Aston Martin DB4 GT, which hit speeds of 153 miles an hour. With all that elegance and no one to possibly catch up in a high speed chase, it's no wonder the Aston Martin became the car of Bond. In the 1960s and 70s, Ferrari was at the top spot in the fast class with its Ferrari 365 GTB4 Daytona, which reached speeds of 174 miles an hour, followed by the Berlinetta Boxer, which was said to be able to reach speeds of 188. It wasn't, but Ferrari still eked out its top spot as the fastest car of the 1970s. With the Berlinetta Boxer a bit of a letdown and the Porsche 959 taking the place as the world's fastest car, Ferrari felt the heat and once again, answered the call. In the 1980s, the Ferrari F40 was the first production car to make it past 200 miles an hour and became the supercar of the decade. 
Probably the first supercar, actually. Once that barrier was broken, the gloves were off. The McLaren F1 reached a speed of 240 in 1998. The carbon fiber production car made 627 horsepower from its BMW V12 engine, making it the fastest car of its era. The Shelby SSC Aero followed and came roaring into the 21st century at 268 miles an hour, followed by the Hennessy Venom GT, which holds the top spot at 301 miles an hour. Mm, sort of. The Hennessy is claimed to go from zero to 249 and back to zero in less than 30 seconds, but Hennessy has yet to confirm the speed with the Guinness Book of World Records, so the real top spot goes to, drum roll please, the Koenigsegg Agera RS at 278 miles per hour. To make things official, Koenigsegg asked the Nevada Department of Transportation to close an 11 mile stretch of Route 160, where the 1,160 horsepower Agera RS hit 284.55 miles per hour during its first run and 271.19 during a second for an average of 277.9 miles per hour. Very impressive stuff, but Koenigsegg wants more, looking square at the big 300. So what's holding streetcars back from 300 miles an hour? While cars like the Bugatti Veyron and Chiron, Chiron, Chiron. We went on this cruise one time and we met this chick from ASU. Her name was Michonne. Hennessy Venom and the Koenigsegg make monster horsepower numbers. That isn't enough to break 300. There are two very big obstacles we need to overcome before we get there. The first being air. At low speeds, we don't think about this much. It's easy to cut through. But as you go past 200, it gets exponentially harder to go faster and faster, requiring more and more power to make gains of even 20 miles an hour. The SSC Ultimate Aero made 985 horses and reached 256. 13 years later, the Agera RS made 175 more horses, but only went 22 miles an hour faster at 276. Building engines capable of that sort of power takes a lot of know-how, especially if you want to put it in a streetcar. But let's pretend we didn't have to worry about reliability and that we built an engine capable of 2,000 horses. And we have a super aerodynamic, street legal, and safe supercar to put it in. Well, there's still something holding us back our tires. The faster you go, the more friction and heat your tires have to deal with. And when your wheels are turning hundreds of times per second, that's a lot of forces pulling on the tires. If you don't have good rubber under you, that's dicey. Both the Chiron and Agera RS use Michelin Pilot Sport 2s, which Michelin says can be pushed to 300, as long as it doesn't take too long to get there. If it takes more than a few minutes to go from 270 to 300, then there's gonna be way too much heat in the tire and it could be compromised. There's a pretty good chance that we'll see a street legal car break 300 miles an hour in our lifetime. The question is, who's gonna do it? I don't know. They could be watching this right now. Hey, we make awesome stuff like this pretty much every day. So make sure you don't miss it by hitting this guy right here. Oh, and hit that notification bell too. Or if you want to know about if you want to know more about tires, check out this episode of Science Garage. Be nice to each other. See you later. Say bye, Dorth. Bye, Dorth. Bye bye.